Thank you, Phil, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today. It's uh, it's great to see the sunshine. I'm glad to see everyone still in here with all the sunshine out there. I thought for sure everyone would be going out. It is uh, it is a great uh, a great pleasure. I've had a, a numerous numerous occasions to present uh, talks similar to this one. Uh, I, I think to give you the foundation of, of what I'll share with you today, uh, certainly related to sustainability, but. Uh, we evaluated our business in 2000, as we, as all good business people do, evaluated daily. But we really took a close look at everything in 2008. It was a downturn that we all like to talk about. I'm glad it was behind us. Uh, but we really looked to identify our greatest assets uh, at Pinehurst, and, and certainly the uh, Pinehurst number two is, is ranks right up there with them, uh, as well as our membership. And some of the slides that I, I've got a slideshow that's way more than than you guys will have time or patience for today. So there's a, a middle section of it that I'll kind of fast forward to to talk about that talks about some of our membership initiatives and the improvements we made to the club. But we really set about in 2008 with a couple of goals in mind. And I give credit to our to Bob Demon, our owner, that owns Pinehurst and Demon family. Um, he, he really he looks at himself as a, as a caretaker of one of golf's greatest uh, icons in the industry. Um, we like to think of Pinehurst as being one of the flame keepers of, of golf, and, and he certainly looks at it from a stewardship position, uh, from looking forward and, and how to protect protect our investments or his investments and make it a sustainable business model going forward. I first got in, uh, involved was asked to speak at the Golf Course Superintendents Conference in San Diego in 2009. I was involved a great deal with the Environmental Institute of Golf and they asked me to speak on sustainability. I had to go, uh, now I'm a Marshall graduate, but I had to go back and look up, look at sustainability. What is sustainability? And I was automatically always focused on the environmental aspect, but it became you know apparent to me as I was preparing and studying for that presentation, I really learned a great deal about the social responsibility aspects of sustainability. Uh, certainly the environmental something, we as superintendents are always, have always been uh, good stewards, I think, of the environment and the resources we have available. But the economic viability is where we really started gaining some traction when we started talking about the economic viability of what we're doing. That's where our owners and our greens chairs and presidents of the club started listening and started paying attention. Frankly, when the economic viability was threatened, then we started, I think, taking some action that is impacting and helping throughout throughout the whole, the whole environment picture of it. It really is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We'll talk today about the biggest piece that we've had involved with, with Pinehurst number two, and, that, and we'll talk about the philosophy of that, and the process of it, and the performance of it, and I think most importantly, probably, is the playability of it. And I think you'll see, uh, we've witnessed that the playability has been pleasantly surprising how our members have embraced it. Really looking back into our roots, of, of where we needed to go with the project. Uh, certainly hiring Bill Corr and Ben Crenshaw, having them on board with us starting in, nine, in, two, in 2009. Um, Crenshaw's idea and, and his viewpoint of restoring the strategy back into it, and with that, uh, certainly uncovering the spirit of what was there. It had become, as you'll see some slides later, uh, certainly nothing that Donald Ross would have recognized. Now I'll give, I'll have to give a little disclaimer here. An old Scottish saying goes, the best golf course is the golf course that fits the land you've got. Now Charles Price chose to say that the Sand Hills of Pinehurst was possibly the most naturally endowed stretch of golfing landscape in America. Now I know everyone from Long Island, and I've, I've since witnessed that, that uh, we're not we're not alone in having a great golfing landscape, but but certainly what he found in Pinehurst certainly reminded him 
of his homeland in Scotland. What he found in Pinehurst was a rolling sand spotted with wire grass. And he essentially left those areas as he found them. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed working with Bill and Ben on this project. Learned so much about what uh, what they felt golf was about, and really the the, the, the spirit really of golf and, and what the Sandhills and Pinehurst meant uh, to golf in the, in the formative years in the early part of the last century. I also give them credit uh, for their vision of what the golf course was and should become once again. And they were frankly uh, uh, very thoughtful of the way they approached it with, with my career. They knew they were getting ready to go in and essentially wipe away my entire body of work as a professional. 30 years of improvements I had been working on with number two, especially. Uh, but frankly, you know, golf course superintendents are great, very much resourceful. We do what we're asked to do. Many times we overachieve in what we're doing. And what we were doing at Pinehurst, I still feel confident the changes that we made to Pinehurst in the 80s and 90s was really overindulgence. We were being asked for that. That's what our market demanded. That's what our clients, our members demanded. And frankly, the USGA. I mean, we had, we had the 99 US Open. It was, a very, it was a great success. Followed by the 2005 US Open. Another great success. And we were providing, making changes and improvements to do to do each of those, and we were very successful at it. But we also recognized that that wasn't sustainable. We can only have, having a U.S. Open every 10 years isn't sustainable from our business model aspect. So Bill, Bill and Ben come on site in March of 2010 and start surveying the landscape. It's literally just walking, talking, we had a great deal of resources available in the Tufts archives uh, of, of what it looked like in the 30s and 40s. We determined the, the era of restoration. Uh, where do you take it back to? I mean, where was its success? What established it as one of the great classic landscapes of that century? And determined that the, the period of time from 1936 when we had the first PGA Championship, actually our, our only PGA Championship. But we had the PGA Championship in 1936, and Donald Ross died in 1948. And we felt like that was really the sweet spot of his contributions to golf. He happened to live there. So uh, when you go to the Tufts archives to do research, which many people do on Ross designs throughout the country, um, architects and club club officials will come to Tufts archives to research Donald Ross. There's less communications in the Tufts archives related to the number two course from Donald Ross than any course in the country. Because he simply didn't have to write communications to people. He didn't have to telegraph people or telegram people. He would just, he was always there. So uh, it's, you really can't go back and do research other than looking at images, which was very good. We also had a 1943 aerial photograph taken by the military on Christmas Day of 1943 uh, that had such clarity and definition with it that you could see people playing golf on the ground that day. So we, that was all insurance for us. That, all, that gave Cora and Crenshaw a great deal of confidence in some of the decisions they were making as they were going through the process. This is an image of the first hole of course number two. You can see the beautiful green, green, greenscape and mono, mono, monoscape of color um, as it relates to the golf course at this time. This was in 2005, narrow fairways following the US Open and actually preparing for it. Uh, bunkers were pretty much irrelevant, out of play. Uh, not a whole lot going on there. Beautiful, beautiful golf course, great golf course, great look, nothing wrong with it, but as Bill uh, Cor liked to say, it, it kind of lost its identity. She didn't know what she wanted to be. 
another image of the 11th, uh, 11th green in the foreground, and you'll see the 12th hole playing away. Really not a great deal of sandscape there, not a great deal of things going on other than a lot of beautiful turf. So we really need to look back, and this is what Corbin Crenshaw um, was able to do with us and the confidence that, ever, that the golf industry would have in them. We needed to look back in order to determine where our future needed to lead us. This is some, one of the images of the ninth hole, par three. This was taken in the, in the mid 30s, early, maybe early 40s, uh, as it looked then. <coughs> this is immediately following the restoration as we've uh, eliminated the turf and done a lot of the work around the green side features. One of the things that we found most noted, uh, the common denominator in this whole process uh, was water. Uh, as we were talking to Corey and Crenshaw, we, we had the, uh, in fact, many of the old center line uh, irrigation lines were still in place in the center of the fairways. And when we started trying to realize what the golf course needed to be, and we started defining our grassing lines of what grass we would take away, uh, it became apparent the, the common denominator was water. We ended up eliminating 45 or 46 acres of turf around the fairways. I'll show you some images of, the, images of that later. Our irrigation head count went from 1,150 to 450 heads. We, did, you know, we just knew we couldn't keep continue to water these areas if we expected them to be truly the sandscapes and, 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 and roughs that we had hoped that, that we planned for them to be. We were using on an annual basis uh, before the project about 55 million gallons of water a year to supplement our 48 inches of rainfall. And now we're, we're using between 12 and 15 million gallons a year. Now, for full disclosure of that, part of that obviously we, we eliminated 40% of the turf, so that you can do the math on that and see where it gets you. But we also stopped overseeding, which was a complete change in culture. Uh, we have changed our culture and the way we uh, evaluate the golf course conditioning each day. We no longer overseed, which gives us a great fall season of golf without having to verticut and do all the things we have to do to overseed. You don't have to water in the fall. We park our fairway mowers that use a lot of fuel. We park those in November and don't get them back out until March or April when it starts growing again. We do paint. We paint the fairways. All of, the, all of these things that we're doing was not a, a cost savings measure, but it was to increase our potential for more income. I mean, that's the way we really looked at the whole, at the whole program. Uh, again, to become more economically sustainable. Regarding the overseeding, we spend as much on paint as we do on the initial cost of the seed to overseed. The cost of overseeding, you certainly don't have to worry much about that up here, but the cost of overseeding in the southeast, the cost of the seed itself is only about a third, maybe 40% of the cost per acre to seed. You've got a lot of premium herbicides you have to use for polo control, fuel, water, labor, and other in the wintertime, all those things. So we've had to really, uh, we've had some good success with it. Certainly there's people that come there in April and May that still expect to see it overseeded, much like our friends down in Augusta, Georgia. Um, and we have to communicate that and we have to educate. And, and I, can, I do that on a daily basis with our other decision makers in our company, especially the sales and marketing people. So it's, it's not without a lot of effort and a lot of discussion. This is an image of the 11th hole <clears throat> with a number of heads on it. That's what it is today. There's essentially nine heads up the center of the fairway. Of the 450 irrigation heads that remain, uh, 350 of them are around the greens and tees. This was kind of one of the aha moments during this thing of, of the things that I learned from Ben, and, and as well read as he is. The term fairway to Donald Ross meant the same as it would to a ship's pilot. To a ship's pilot, fairway means a navigable channel 
through rocks. And if you look it up in Webster's or you Google fair, that's one of the definitions of fairway, which I never had any clue of. Um, it's a navigable channel through rocks, sandbanks, and other obstructions. That's the safest way for a vessel to enter or leave a harbor. As in the case of golf, it's a, nav it's a channel to go from tea to green. That's really, that was in Don Ross's fabric. That was his DNA of, of, of that ship and that fairway. Consequently, Ross didn't create rough to border a fairway. And this will be, 2014 will be the, as far as I know, no one's ever debated the first U.S. Open contested with no rough. It'll have no turf grass rough. It will have rough. It'll have broken ground. He dressed a channel or the fairway through the, what he referred to as broken ground. Rocks, sand, whatever it might be that you didn't want to get to, but he would give you a safe way to get there. And really looking at the strategy and the strategic lines that Ben was so focused on. You've heard him talk about Augusta National losing some of the strategic lines that he liked to play at Augusta. And, uh, interestingly enough, on this slide, this is the seventh hole. Sharp dog at right. Uh, that entire area on the right side that's now sand, what I like to call sandscape. Uh, that used to be a, a, a collection of really nicely manicured, beautiful bunkers. Uh, we did a great job with them. Certainly don't look that way today. And that runs right into the green side bunker. Now you see the two bunkers on the left of the green. Those are all, that entire right side that used to be about eight bunkers. We, we now play that as through the green. That's just part of the through the green. The only bunkers on that hole now as we play them today are the two on the left that have a definable margin of turf. Now the USGA will have a whole different program of that uh, for the US Open Championship. They'll have rules officials obviously and referees with each group uh, to make rules decisions and we'll let them do their business to conduct the championship and that will be the way that's determined. See the other area on the left is kind of interesting. Mike Davis was very instrumental in working with us through this whole process. Every site, Ben and Bill were there, Mike was there, helping them determine the width of the fairways. Um, and they're about twice as wide as they were in 05. You see the left side there. We had it laid out, removed the turf. Mike really wanted it a little bit narrower over the neck. He wanted it about 16 feet narrower. Bill and Ben wanted not to move it, but but agreed to move it about 12 feet. It was back and forth, back and forth. We put a flag down at 12 feet. Bill went out there on the sky the next morning and moved it about six inches. <laughs> I mean, he thinks in those terms, in that minutia of a term. Uh, but they have had, we've had a great three-way relationship with USGA and Mike, setting the golf course up to define the champion, determine the champions. Bill and Ben really focused on the membership and people that enjoy the enjoyment factor. And that's been, it's been a wonderful, wonderful process. Another image of the seventh hole from a different angle. You can see how the, you, again, you can see the ship's channel. You can see the fairway, the navigable channel up through the sand and broken ground to get to the green. This is the first green. One of the other interesting facets with the with the course now. We've never really had rough around the greens. Number two has always been noted for its green surrounds and, and playable shortcut areas around the greens. But many of the greens now, the ball literally will roll from the green and roll out into the sand. I won't spend a great deal of time. I'll, I'll try to save some time for questions, hopefully, uh, about any U.S. Open setup and some of those things. But uh, our focus right now is on the firmness of the greens texture of the greens and speed being third, probably third priority. They will be around 11 and a half to 12, but right now the focus of the firmness of the greens is our primary focus. This is the fifth hole. You can see how the irrigation starting to kind of tail out on the sides. This is painted. When we paint them, we allow the paint to also fade out. We don't want a hard edge, contrived look of paint. Uh, very difficult par four for previous championships. It's actually going to be played as a par five this year for the 2014, which is just as it was in 1936. It was played as a par five. The green is very severe, uh, especially for a long par four. Uh, 
Uh, so it's really going to fit right into the to the uh, program of the championship. See the area behind the green that's sand, that little ribbon of sand. That's, that's that separates the third and fifth green. Again, the balls will roll off and go into the sand. You can see the broken ground uh, expressing itself on the right hand side. Literally, this from the, and Dave referred to this earlier. Strategically, from the center of the fairway, which is where it's most well irrigated, and the turf is significantly di different, it's got more density, the ball sets up better, it's more resilient, but when you leave the center and stray from that 10 feet, 20 feet, 40 feet, it's a declining uh, opportunity to have a good, good lie. You can still be in fairway turf, but the ball may be setting down really tight. Is that fair? Not really, but no one ever promises it was going to be. But it does add the strategic the strategy to it of trying to find the center of the fairway without a border of rough that Donald Ross referred to earlier. It's the fourth hole. Uh, it'll, it'll play as a par four and 14 instead of a five. Uh, again, you can see the difference on the left of the screen as before, and now the navigable fairway again, the channel up the middle uh, of the the bunker on the right is a new one that was found in the 1943 photograph. This is probably the best example, real quickly. Uh, 13th hole before, from one of our first processes was literally to strip the fairways, the, the rough uh, with sod cutters. That's what it looked like in about two days after we started. Again, that sand, this is native sand. It's kind of fading out and bleaching itself. The edges at that time were with sod cutters, we've really worked hard to eliminate that look. But that was the second step of it. We started planting the wiregrass, about 200,000 transplanted plants of wiregrass from around the community. Um, that's the only thing that was introduced in there, but it was critical that we didn't, we didn't, we left all the soil in place, we didn't excavate anything, so we knew there would be a lot of other native vegetation that would, um, that would want to grow there. And this is what's growing in those areas now. This is Port Chalaca. There's about three or four acres of that. You can play from that. It's kind of succulent. The ball comes out of it. The divot actually takes root as it explodes and it just continues to uh, get more and more. We've identified uh, over 50 native species that have, wanted, that have decided they'll grow there again. Uh, certainly Sandhills cactus, some morning glory, some other sedges. Really gives you a diversity, a great diversity of plants. It changes once a you, know, change, you can play it once a month for a year to be different. We don't obsess with trying to make it perfect. We don't use any. The only herbicides we use is where we'll find some Bermuda wanting to grow again in those areas, and we'll spray it to ground up. But we don't obsess ourselves with it. We don't overindulge to try to protect, uh, to protect it and show it off. Uh, it just is what it is. We've had a complete change of culture the way we manage number two. We only have one person working on the crew that's there now, that, uh, that was in there in 2009, that's still there. It wasn't like we eliminated all of them. We moved them to other courses that were doing good, different kinds of work. We had to change the way people look at it. I'll give you a quick run through of, uh, this is the first hole. It's the second from the left side. Again, you can see some of the diversity and some of the, uh, the areas that we'll have on the short par fours. If the ball leaves the fairway, it probably will go into kind of a loose sand, footprints everywhere kind of situation. Or it may roll up against hard pan or into hard pan. That's an easy shot for the, for the best in the world. Or it may get in the wiregrass corner. The players won't have any idea when they leave the tee what to, what they took to expect. Whereas before, when they, if the ball left the fairway, they knew there would be a three and a half inch rough and they were going to advance it and go on. This way, you never, they'll never know until they get to the ball. So short par four, third hole, we play as a par four, or a drivable par four for the men and women. In 14, another view of the third hole. You see the, 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 the vertical, diverse, there's more vertical nature to the, with the, uh, with the wiregrass and different vegetation, it gives you a different, completely different perspective and texture. Fourth hole on the right side. 
as you approach the fifth green, six hole, great par three, plays about 198, I think, par three. This is a shot of the seventh hole that I showed you earlier, the, the aerial images of the earlier. Eighth hole. One of the other cool things about this project compared to the preparing for 99 and 05, it was all just about building tees and adding length. Uh, if we were to go out there to play today and play from the reasonable tees, it wouldn't have affected your golfing experience at all because all the, everything was behind you, the, the new tees were. This project affected everyone from the play it forward tee as far as you want, and you still it still affected it because you had no rough, the fairways are water, you've got new bunkers in different places, completely different look. So it's, it's the, the, our members have really embraced the idea and concept of it. And I talked about that so much, and then I realized that, you know because I said, well, we're adding width this time, we're not adding length and all these things. But when I looked at back at my notes, we had ended up building 13 new tees. <laughs> and we did, in fact, add some length. It could play as long as 75.50. Now, not that it will, but it could, because uh, it will set it up differently each day. As well as the women's, I think the women's are right now measured at 68.2, I believe, and they'll be certainly less than that on a daily basis. Par 3, ninth hole. Kevin, how am I doing on time? I didn't have my... Good. Tenth hole part. There's another bunker on the left that was found in the aerial images. One of the areas, uh, the second shot landing area on the tenth hole. We that's one of the, probably the most noted narrow areas that that uh, Mike Davis really wanted to. Uh, he went much narrower than what Bill and Ben uh, really wanted to. But when they're laying up there, that he really wants to be, have it be an exacting shot. There's many of these areas that we'll go back and and put some turf, fairway turf back in, following the championship. But it's not like we're having to widen the fairways or narrow the fairways a great deal, other than just doing them to grass, taking away the turf. Eleventh hole. Twelfth hole will be a great par four. Build a new tee on the, for those of you who've played there before, you play from the 18th tee on four to play the twelfth hole on two with this, with this championship. Forget the number, but it's a long way back there. This is shot of the 13th I showed you earlier where we've taken away the, the turf through the evolution of it those, those times. This is, this is the area where all the Portulaca, or where all the Portulaca is that I mentioned. 13th short par four uphill. 14th is as good as any par four that on the course, and it's, it's a great stretch of finishing holes from 14 through 15. This is the left side of 14. This is the 15th green. This is one of the few greens we made any tweaks at all to the putting surface recreated and found and recreated uh, some whole locations on the right side that we'd lost over the years. Um, that'll be a really, a there's a really great whole location on the back right, and I think we'll get a lot of discussion about it in the championship broadcast. This is 16th par four, place of par four, the championship. 17, 17 T. we end up building a new T on that hole. We wanted the, the players to hit a five iron on that hole. Ended up having to build a tee about 225 or something in order to make sure that happened. I can't even relate to some of that. <laughs> I mentioned earlier our, our focus on sustainability and, uh, and the membership being such a great asset for us. And frankly, I think we'd, we'd probably taken our eye off the ball of that. In the 80s and 90s, we our resort business was going so gangbusters. But we do also have a membership component, and um, when the downturns happen, even in the early 200s or 2000s, and we get to 2008, we really started seeing the value of having those members and the members sending checks in every month, and us knowing that's a foundation for what we can do 
except for waiting on the U.S. Open to happen every 10 years or so. So one of the commitments that we made, we finished number two project, and that, that had gone really well, good capital investment on the owner's part, and then we started focusing on, focusing on the clubhouse in order to create our, and improve and enhance our membership model. I'm glad to say that's turned out great. We've added about 1,000 members, had about 400 membership upgrades, we just announced this week that we've actually purchased a National Golf Club across the street from, this used to be Pinehurst Nationals and that Jack Nicklaus sign. We just bought that club. So we're really growing our membership base again. This is the old South View historic elevation of the clubhouse. This is what it looked like before. The awnings really hiding any view from the outside or from the inside looking out. Had the architects built it. We recreated a new facade around the outside of the clubhouse with the arches kind of extending that theme around. Very proud of that. The membership have really embraced it, really supporting it a great deal. Proud to have it uh, ready for the U.S. Opens coming up. This is some of the interior shots, the differences in the way it looks for those of you that have an interest in that. This is the old 1970s model, I guess, if you will, the uh, foyer. It's a lot more bright, open. This is the two view rooms, the old members bar. Now it's a very beautiful dining room overlooking the first tee. A lot more going on on the outside. Outdoor dining, certainly trying to uh, capture that. Uh, you see the awning in place there. You, this is a, a before picture. The awning is covering the sky. You can't really see anything at all through it. Again, that's the way it looks today. A lot more, a lot better view of the golf course. Certainly Payne Stewart, our great champion from 99. Some of the south facing verandas. And then our championship as we go in. This will be our third U.S. Open championship in 15 years. Uh, the 12th in our community, 12th USGA championship in, in the last 20 years. Uh, and, and I always, uh, it wasn't our idea to have the back-to-backs. It was USGA's. I'm going to go on record with that. <laughs> but I will say there's very few places, and, and I've heard other USGA officials say it, very few, if any, places in the country uh, would they consider having the site of back-to-back -back championships like that. And it's not because of the, the wonderful staff I have or we have. It is a wonderful staff and employees at Pinehurst. It's a wonderful golf course. There's wonderful golf courses everywhere. But really our community is what helps it happen. There's over 6,500 volunteers needed to pull this off for these two weeks. And the spirit of community in our community, the civic mindedness of the willingness to volunteer, the golf DNA, all those things and our regional support from all of our government officials and, and, and golf associations and other club associations that's really what enables us, or makes makes us feel confident that we'll have a great and successful championship with it. I think my time is about it for my time. Thank you again, and I look forward to visiting with you during lunch.